Good morning, everyone out there in Facebook land as well, and to my sisters who also are on the call. So I am, um, I think I'm all worked up. I couldn't see. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't see. And I don't know if it was because of, oh, my God, the worship this morning. I guess it's just something about being in the midst. And those young ladies this morning really blessed me. I was like, ooh, we, okay, I'm gonna get up and teach. After all of that, they got up and, and sang their hearts out, um, reminded us, Lord, you are good all the time, and all the time you are good. So in case anybody has forgotten that, I need you to think on that. Those ladies blessed us, brought us into the presence of the Lord on this morning, and then said, all these blessings come from God. Jesus promised that he'll take care of me. Jesus promised he'll take care of you. And then they ended it with, he's able. God can do it. He is able. I was sitting in here like, oh, Lord, Jesus. Okay, okay. So in case y'all forgot, remember, God is able. God is able. Okay, so today, um, well, let's pause. Let's go to God in prayer first. Lord, again, we thank you, God. Just thank you, Lord, for your presence. God, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for um, just being so good. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your joy. Thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of things not like we would really prefer them to be, things are a little kind of chaos, God. You are still good. You are still God, Lord, and we love you. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this time, God. We ask, Lord, that you would speak today as only you can, that you would make your word clear, that you would make it plain to us, God, that you would sit me down, God, calm my spirit, calm me down, slow me down, God, speak through me, God, speak your word, Lord, that your sisters, your women are helped and encouraged when we finish what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, so I believe most of you all have your handouts. Um, and the lesson this morning is keeping your focus on Christ. When your walls are tumbling down, Mark 7, verses 24 through 30. And so I first want to uh, thank Pat, our sister Pat Gaddison, who blessed us on the last two Sundays, talking about imperatives for Christian living. God bless you, my sister. I was encouraged, although while studying for my lesson between you and Pastor, I listened to Pastor on Friday on KHCB, who reminded us that even though we're in this pandemic right now, and um, thing, like I said, things are uncomfortable, it is not really the way we would want it, Pastor reminded us that we're not the first ones on lockdown. Paul was also on lockdown. Paul was in jail. And even while he was in prison, Paul was encouraging others to say, rejoice. He kept saying it throughout the book of Philippians, to rejoice. And I'm looking at this lesson, I'm saying, when your walls are tumbling down, we are still able to walk around. We may be locked down, as the city says, but we're able to walk around. We are not behind bars. We are not in a prison. But Paul, in a prison, says, rejoice. And we're complaining because they're talking about when they lock the city down, they're talking about possibly locking it down again. But we're complaining about that. Paul was in prison, don't forget that. And he was saying, rejoice, encouraging somebody else to rejoice. So I encourage you, my sisters, I encourage you all, anybody who's listening and paying attention, to rejoice, to re whatever your wall is, to rejoice. Okay, so I'm not real sure what your wall is. Um, it could be your family, you could be having family issues, and unfortunately, too many of us are pinning a lot of things on this pandemic, but if you were already having family issues before the pandemic, that's only increased it. It didn't cause it. So your wall could be your marriage, things not like they should be in your marriage, lack of communication, lack of support. It could be um, because, yes, we are in the, in the pandemic, that the choices that are being made uh, regarding our children, whether our children are going to be going to school or whether they're going to be homeschooled, uh, having school virtually, that could be a wall tumbling down because it's uncomfortable. It's something different that we have to do. 
um, it could be this summer, the kids already uh, stressing when school was in, now, this, now the school is out. Uh, no summer vacations, people who made plans and had to cancel plans because of where we are right now. Uh, those who are looking for jobs and you can't find a job. Those who've been laid off from a job and who had a severance and then severance is ended. And then you're trying to get unemployment and you got unemployment and then unemployment ended. Walls tumbling down. So, so, but, but, the, but the passage tells us to keep your focus on Christ. To keep your focus on Christ when your walls are tumbling down. Now when you think about focus, Focus is defined as to cause to be concentrated, focused attention to the most urgent problems. The definition, to cause to be concentrated, focus their attention on the most urgent problems. That's what it is to focus. So that's how it's defined. It says to adjust the focus of the eye. Focus the telescope. Now if our subject is keeping our focus on Christ, we are focusing what? If we are adjusting our focus and our attention, that says that something else has our attention. That says that something is not sitting quite right because my focus is not on Christ. So now I've got to adjust my focus, adjust my thought pattern, adjust my heart so that I'm now focused on Christ. Because if I'm focused on Christ, when my walls are tumbling down, it's not going to be as bad as it looks like because my focus has been adjusted. My focus is on Christ. We've got to keep Christ as the center. Remember I said, the young ladies reminded us, he is good all the time. We've got to adjust our focus. Keep your focus on him. And then when it talks about tumbling, tumbling is defined as to fall helplessly down, end over end, by losing one's footing. You, you typically think of a person who is tumbling almost face forward, tumbling down. Um, your equilibrium is off. You're, he you're plunging head forward. So, he, so when your walls are tumbling down, it's like everything around us is falling. Out. Again, it's four months, four months today. We would have never thought we would be in the situation where we are now. For us, that's a wall tumbling down. Because who would have thought, basically, your main priority is going to work, going to the grocery store as needed, or ordering online and going to pick up and coming back home. For me, I do have some little side businesses, and I have these drive-by pickups. Because why? This is not the time to be having a social gathering. This is not the time to be... Somebody missed the memo, though. I don't know if y'all been looking at the news, if y'all been on uh, social media, a lot of people are missing the headline that we should not be having these large gatherings. So it is, we have now got to focus on the fact that because we come together and we don't understand why things are happening, your walls are tumbling down because your focus is not on Christ. We're upset because we are where we are, but the law tells us we ought to obey the law of the land. And the law of the land says we should not be gathering together. So right now, we need to keep our focus on Christ. We need to be careful because every one of us has a particular wall that we consider a wall in our life that is tumbling down. But it, we make things worse because we don't keep our focus on Christ. We're not obeying what we should be doing. So we're going to go into our passage, which is Mark 7, verses 24 through 30. And I'm going to read that for us. And I'm assuming we're all there. And verse 24, so I need a little help here. Verse 24 reads, And from there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Seraphonician by birth, and she kept asking him, to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, 
she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. So the first point of your outline says, stay focused by being humble in his presence while not being embarrassed to go before other people if it is necessary. All right? So let's, um, let's back up a little bit, though. Let's go back up into chapter, the first part of chapter 7, and just so we can kind of get a context of where we are. So in the first few verses, you first see where the Pharisees, with their traditions, basically were charging up Jesus regarding why the disciples didn't wash their hands according to tradition. They had this tradition that you washed your hands, fingers up, fingers down, wrists together. They had these traditions. So now you've got these Pharisees who are charging up Jesus saying, hey, what's going on? Why is it that, why is it that they're not following the traditions when they come in to eat? But notice verse 6. Notice Jesus come back to them. He says in verse 6, well, did Isaiah prophesy? I'm so I'm sorry. Well, the prophesy did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? He says, these. I, I'm sorry. Let me slow down. Verse six says he answered and said to them, Well, did, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites? As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from it, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines of the commandments of men. So basically what he's telling them, he says, y'all so worried about what the disciples doing, how they wash it and not wash it. He said, how about what I've been, what I've already been told about you all? Y'all are hypocrites. You saying one thing, but you're doing another. So then he goes on to say in verses eight and nine, he said, you lay aside the commandment of God, yet you holding the tradition of men by washing pitchers and cups. He said, you t if you think they're making a big deal about washing fingers down, fingers up, wrists together, you ought to see them, how they wash their pitchers and the pots. He said, y'all making a big deal out of that, but yet you reject the commandment of God so you can hold on to your traditions, all right? Notice what's going on. Then when we get to verse 10, Again, Pharisees, they, they, everybody has something to say about what Jesus is doing. We get to verse 10. He says, Moses said to honor your father and mother, and he who curses them, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you, you have received from me is Corbin, that is dedicated to the temple, that you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect, through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you, and many such things you do. So basically, what he's saying is, again, y'all are taking the traditions I have and putting them aside because you want to do your own thing. He's saying you saying it's all right for somebody to say, oh, what you have, this gift you have, you can give it to me, to God, to a temple, but yet it still not take care of their parents. No, that's not that is not what's being taught. Then he goes on to verse fourteen, and then he says. Um, then he says, uh, there's nothing that enters a man from the outside can defile him. It's only what comes out. It does, it's what's entering. So I say, what you eat, that doesn't defile you because that's eliminated. He say, it's what comes out of your heart. It's the things that you say in verses 21 through 23. He say, far from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit licentiousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So basically what he's telling him, he said, you see everything that's going to how they are charging him up. Jesus' primary ministry was to the Jews, although we've read several encounters with the, with the Gentiles, but now he's having an encounter with this Gentile woman. So I'm bringing you up to where we are. So when we get to verse now 24, Luke 25, and it says, he arose and went to a region of Ty Tyre and Sidon. He entered a house, wanted no one to know, but he couldn't be hidden. Because now you've got this woman whose daughter has an unclean spirit, heard about him, and she came, fell at his, at his feet. So she comes and she falls at his feet, prostrate before someone that she knows can help her. She is prostrating herself to bow down low, uh, uh, implying supplication to him because she's heard about what he's done and she says, I've got a daughter now who, who 
has an unclean spirit, and who else to go to? So for this Syrophoenician woman, this Greek woman, her wall is falling down because she has this daughter now, like I said, who has an unclean spirit. She's heard about Jesus, so she comes to him. Now, your outline tells you, know that he is always aware of what you're going through. Jesus is not, he is not, okay, okay. Case, in case y'all forgot, Jesus is omniscient. So he knows everything. He already knows what you're going through. Hebrews 4.15 tells us, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. No, God has knows it all. He's been through it all, so he can relate to us. So you think about when it is that you're going through something and you're having a hard time, you, you don't call up somebody who has no clue. You want to talk to a friend who has an idea, who maybe has gone through something similar that you've gone through because you want somebody to be able to kind of, you know, be able to talk about, girl, what did, what did you do? How did you handle it? This is how I'm feeling. Did you feel like this? Am I way off? She, the word of God tells us that we go to our friends first, but the word of God tells us that we have a high priest who already knows. He can sympathize with us because he knows what we've gone through because he knows everything. God is aware of everything that we're going through. He knows, B, B, B tells us, now know that he comes at times when circumstances are at their toughest. Now, what, what, how, how much tougher can things be? This is a mother who, whose daughter has an unclean spirit. Now, you've got this mother who is coming. She's heard about Jesus, so she is coming to the one that she believes can help her daughter. She's coming. She has prostrated herself before before Jesus because she believes that he can help her. She is coming to him. Something else that, that our sister told us on last Sunday, Sister Pat told us on last Sunday, that um, we are to practice true humility. Uh, she told us that true humility is not thinking of ourselves at all. She said humility is clothed like an apron. She also told us that that Humility is the willingness to put on the lowliest, littlest task. So imagine a mother, this mother, a mother's heart. She's pleading. She's asking. She didn't care. She comes prostrate before Christ, falls at his feet to, let, to talk to him about her. She didn't care who was looking. She didn't care what they thought. She didn't care what it looked like. She didn't care who said what. She didn't care if they thought she should be there or shouldn't be there. All was on her mind was her daughter. And those of us who are mothers, we, we can understand and feel her pain. We know how it is when our children are hurting, babies, adult children, whatever they are, they are still our children. And when, we, when our children are going through, when they are hurting, when they are in pain, we will, we will tear walls down to get to Jesus. We're going to do whatever we can to make our plea before Christ because we know that no matter how much I talk to my friend and how much I talk to my mother and how much I talk to my girlfriend and how much I talk to my cousin or my counselor or my teacher or my doctor, nobody can help me and take care of the situation like Jesus. I can remember even to this day a week before my son made eight years old. And we're sitting in the doctor's office, and they're saying to us, he has diabetes, juvenile diabetes. No, can't be. Can't be. It doesn't run in our family. Oh, yes, can be. No, can't be. doesn't run in our family. It doesn't happen. Oh, yeah, yes, it, it, ma'am, it, it's not necessarily heredity, hereditary, ma'am. It, it, you know, it can be a virus, and it can attach itself to anyone. And I'm sitting here in disbelief, like this is not, this is not my life. This is not, this is not happening. And when you've got a child who is used to going and doing, and now you, got, and you hear that your child now is going to have to take insulin and have blood sugars checked, taken, and they've got to take blood, and he is petrified of needles. 
and it's taking three nurses and a doctor and a daddy to hold him down just to take blood. You plead to God, you plead to God for comfort, for understanding that he take it away. You don't care. You don't care what people think. You don't care who's watching because you want God to fix your situation. When you have a child who's eight years old who's asking you, why me, mama? Why me? Why I got to have diabetes? Why me? Why I'm the one got to take insulin? Why me? You plead and you cry to God and you ask God, God, I need your help. If you're not going to remove it, God, I need you to help. I need you to help me to know how to administer, how to help my baby, how to help my child. So imagine this woman who comes before God. She doesn't care what the people are saying. She doesn't care what they think. She doesn't. All she cares about is her daughter, her daughter who has a, a demon, and she wants the demon cast out of her daughter. So she is coming before Jesus. She comes to him, and she says, God, I am going to prostrate. I'm going to lay myself here before God because I know if nobody else can help me, he can. The uh, Hebrews again tells us that we are to come therefore boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in the time of need. We got to go before God. When we have an issue, God says, come to me. Stop going to everybody else. First, you got to come. I'm the one, so we've got to keep our focus and our attention on Christ. So now we've got this mother. Goes before God. Um, the letter C tells us, never allow your pride to get in the way. First Peter 5 and 6, uh, which reads, the, the B clause of, I'm sorry, let me turn there real quick. Oh, Jesus. Okay, First Peter 5, um, God says, God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. But therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So, again, it says, never let your pride, never allow your pride to get in the way. Again, this lady, she was not going to, like I said, she was not being prideful. She had forgotten all about herself. Uh, one of the things that our, our sister Pat told us on last Sunday, too, is that we've got to think about self-forgetfulness. And that is what this woman demonstrated, self-forgetfulness. She, she forgot all about herself. She says, no, I am going before God because I need help. I need someone to help me with my daughter who has a demon uh, a demon spirit. She wanted the demon cast out of her. So what she does is goes before God, prostrates herself before him because she wants to make herself known to him. Not embarrassed at all about going before people because I'm going, I got to get to God. I got to get to the one who can help me. Okay. Now we're going to um, Roman number two. And it says, stay focused by being persistent in your knowledge that he alone is the answer to your problem, regardless to the cultural and traditional thinking around you, verses 26 and 27. It says, the woman was a Greek, a Seraphonician, I'm sorry, the woman was a Greek, a Seraphonician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. All right. So, again, this woman was a Greek, Seraphonician by birth. So, again, she was focused on God. She's focused on her persistence in getting to him. Because what she knew is that he was the answer to her problem. She wasn't worried about the culture. She wasn't worried about the traditions of the Jews saying, oh, she's a Greek. She shouldn't be here. She shouldn't be talking to Jesus. Where's she going? What she, she was not worried about that at all. All she was worried about, self-forgetfulness, forgetting about herself, coming as humbly as she knows how, coming to Jesus and kept asking him, kept asking him. Not one time. When it says kept, that means repeatedly. When it says she kept asking, she didn't ask just one time. Well, I asked him and he didn't answer. No, 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 no. 
as a mother, she kept asking again and again, God, I've got a daughter who has a demon spirit, Lord, and I need this demon removed from her. So she kept asking. It tells us the Greek word for kept asking is erota. It's an imperfect tense. It's something that happens over and over and over again. It re it's repeatedly, you repeatedly request something from someone, and that's what she did. She kept going to Jesus saying, my daughter has a demon, in, my daughter has a demon, my daughter has a demon, my daughter has a demon in her. Daughter, can you cast out the demon? Lord, can you please cast out the I need this, ca this demon cast out of my daughter. When she's like, she's not herself, she's, she's abusive, she destroys things, she's, she's just not the same. Lord, can you please cast the demon? I just want my baby back. I just I just want her back as she, I don't want the, can you please remove the demon from her? So she kept asking again and again and again and again. Sometimes we get tired out and we stop asking too soon. God says, I'm here. I am here. I want you to, I already know. I already know what's in your heart. I already know what needs to happen. I already know what I'm going to do. I know what you're going to do. But I want you to keep coming to me again and again and again and again. That's what I'm here for. I want you to keep asking me. When she does, Jesus says to her, let the children be filled first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, when he says this, in that, in that time, the children, when he says children be fed, he's referring to Israel, okay? Because again, he's talking about the Jews. When he talks about little dogs, the tradition there was that anything less than a Jew was considered a dog, mean, vicious. The worst kind is what, he's, is what they're describing. So unfortunately, non-Jews were viewed as less than. That was the culture. They were viewed as less than. They were viewed as outcasts. The Jews, the Pharisees, had a better than mentality. Like, um, you know, they had it all going on. If you didn't do it like we said, as the Jew, as the Pharisees, then you were beneath us. You were lower than. Remember, I first talked about the washing of the hands. You know, they came in, they had to wash their hands. Like I said, fingers, fingers down, fingers up, wrist. All of these traditions that you had to do before you could eat, especially if they had been to the marketplace. So for them, as a Jew, as a Pharisee, if you were a non-Jew, the Pharisees felt like you were nothing. You, you, amount, you were an outcast because, again, they've got this pride. They're better than mentality. So when, when, when he says to her, the children has to be fed, fed first, it's not good. We can't take the bread from the, from, from the we can't. It's not good to take children's bread and throw it to the little dogs is what he was telling her. But this lady, she, that was okay. It was good for her because she had enough belief in Jesus and him healing her daughter that she stated to him, even the crumbs. When we get to verse 28, she says, it says, and, he sh and she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Basically what she's saying is, you know what? If the crumbs is what I can get, that's going to work for me. So the problem with a lot of us is we we too specific. We want to have things a certain way. You know, this this lady was, okay, we, okay, back up, back up, back up. Okay, let me hold on, slow down. Because she knew God was concerned about all people. He's concerned about, concerned about everything. Your outline kind of says he's concerned about everybody. She also knew he had the power to heal, to deal with the demonic spirits brought on by the fall of man, of brought on by the fall of humanity. He is aware of the prejudices that prejudices that various people have toward one another. So Jesus already knew. He knew the setting. This woman now walks up. She knew. She walks up. She has not a concern in the world but the fact that her daughter has a demon spirit and she wants Jesus to cast it out. That was the only thing on her mind. And like I said, as a mother, doesn't matter. I don't see you. I don't see blue. I don't see green. I don't see him. I don't see her. I don't see them. I don't care what they say. I don't hear the snickers. I don't hear the rumor. I don't care because right now my focus is my child. I want my child healed, and that's what this woman was doing. She is coming before Jesus because she says, I know he can do it. And when he responds to her, 
the crumbs are you is we can't we can only give you the crumb he says uh yet even the she says to him yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs she says hey when even the dogs eat the children's crumbs y'all know think about it our kids they eat and they drop the stuff on the floor and any of any of you all I, I love y'all like my husband say I love y'all because y'all love pets but okay so any of you all who got little cute little pets that run around anything they drop they eating it the dogs are picking it up this woman says that's fine if that's all I can get is a crumb that's fine I'm fine with that in her mind again she wasn't being particular she didn't say oh no you know I wanted it to be you know a t-bone steak and if it's not a t-bone steak for my baby and it needs to be medium well because if it's not that no I can't have that or you know she didn't say oh well because it's not seafood you know or well you know Lord you know we're vegan and if we could just get some vegan food she didn't she didn't come with a, she didn't say you know oh Lord, I need it to be wheat bread or I need it to be rye or I need it to be whole wheat I need it to be white bread this lady didn't care where it came from. She said, if all I can get is the crumbs, I got enough belief in Jesus to know that that crumb alone, if you say that's what I got to take, I'm good with that. I just want the demon removed from my child. I want the demon cast from my child. She kept asking. She kept asking. He says to her, even, she says to him, even the little dogs, even, uh, even the little dogs un under the table eat the children's crumbs. She says, and if that's what you say, I've, I've got to wait. i got to get in line, and i got to wait and come back and sweep up all the crumbs. Lord, I'm here. I'm here. Because if that's what it's going to take for me to get my baby healed, if that's what it's going to take for you to cast the demon out, I'm here. I'm here for all the crumbs. All the crumbs that's left over, I'm here. I'm going to pick them up. I'm going to be on bended knee. I'm crawling all over the ground, picking up the crumbs. If that's what it's going to take, because I believe you're going to cast out. I believe you can heal my daughter. Okay, and then Roman, Roman, Newman, Roman numeral number three. Stay focused by trusting Jesus with the final results based on what he has already proven he has done for others. Verses 28 through 30. And I've kind of already hit a little bit on that, but we can go over it again, 28 through 30. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had gone to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. So, again, um, I've kind of already got, went through verse 28. I went a little ahead of myself, but it's okay. Basically, the word tells us that he listens to those, again, on your hand, I listen to those who are viewed as outcasts, even from their own personal perspective. He honors those who maintain their faith in him when their walls are tumbling down. He changes the difficulties that affects us directly and indirectly. So again, like I said, because he is listening to this woman, this mother, he is listening to this woman, listening to her heart for her daughter, saying that if, if the crumbs are what you're saying that I can have, I, I believe they got to be fed first, and I got to take the crumbs, I'm good with that. I, because what I believe is that is enough to heal my daughter. Um, he basically her wall is falling down her wall is crumbling down for her but she, but this lady was maintaining her faith she maintained her faith in Jesus knowing that he had the answer knowing that he had the cure knowing that he could heal without a doubt nothing in her mind doubted that all she knew is she had to get to him she needed to get to Jesus fall prostrate before him so she could get to him and say I got a daughter who has a demon and I need the demon cast out of my daughter so she believes she believes by faith that he would he he will do this in 29 he says for this saying because for her to answer him and says say to him yes lord even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs jesus is like wow what okay uh, okay he he, he know, because of her belief he knows that her answer said she had enough belief that she's going to respond to jesus and say even the crumbs, Jesus said, you know what? Because of your faith, the demon, the demon has gone out of your daughter. 
Be only because you believe. She did again, maybe it wasn't what she thought it was going to be. All she knew is, I just need to get close to him. All she knew is Jesus could heal. Because, again, she knew she had already heard about some of the things he had done. She knew what he had done. You think about um, previous to that. I keep thinking when I, was, when I was studying this, I said, okay, is it that possibly when you go back to chapter 6 that maybe she had heard that when he fed the 5,000 not counting, 5,000 uh, men not counting women and children with five loaves, five loaves and two fish. Okay, again, I'm going to say 5,000 men, not five men, 5,000. Five, not 50 men, 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Okay, five loaves and two fish. And they were all full. And they had 12 baskets of leftovers. Nobody can do that but Jesus. Maybe that's what she heard. Maybe that's all she needed to hear. Hmm, okay. Then when she heard, hears about the people that were sick, that touched the hem of his garment. Everyone that touched him, as many of them touched him, they were made well. Maybe that's what she heard, and maybe that's all she needed to hear. Because if Jesus can do that for, I'm going to go back to the 5,000. You're talking 5,000 men, that's not including women and children, with five loaves of bread. Five loaves of bread. Our family get together on the first Sunday, and it's like when everybody come together, it's like 21 of us. I don't know when we buy, when we buy five dozen of the Hawaiian rolls, mm -hmm, yeah, Zach, that everybody loves. I don't even know if that's enough. We're talking five loaves of bread for 5,000 people, two fish. Okay, they were all full and had leftovers, 12 baskets of leftovers. Okay, again, like I say, maybe that's all she needs to hear. Okay, uh, then maybe she heard about uh, the man that Jesus had healed, the demon-possessed man. If Jesus can heal a demon-possessed man, again, we're back in chapter 6, maybe she had already heard this. If he can heal this demon-possessed man who had an unclean spirit, who was living in the mountains in chains and shackles, he would break them out, they couldn't tame him. This man is crying out night and day, cutting himself up with stones. He cries out to Jesus, Come, okay, okay. He cries out, and Jesus says to the man, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Maybe that's what she heard. Maybe that's all she needed to hear. Or has she heard about Jairus' daughter? Y'all know the story. Jairus comes to him, he falls at his feet, and he says, my daughter lies on the, on the point of death. She lies on the bed. She's dying. Lord, I need you to come. And they're trying to stop him. They're trying to stop Jairus. He don't have time for that. No, no, no. Jairus says, can you just come lay your hands on my daughter? Can you come lay your hands on my daughter and heal her? And she will live. Maybe that's what she heard. Maybe she heard about the woman who had the issue of blood. And all she had to do was touch the hem of his garment. And she says, wait a minute. If this woman can touch the hem of Jesus' garment and be made whole because of her belief, surely I can go to Jesus to ask the plea for him to cast this demon out of my daughter. Maybe again, that's all she needs because immediately when she touches the hem of his garment, the word of God says immediately the fountain of blood dried up. Immediately, not the next month, not in three more days, not in two more days, not two weeks later. It said immediately the blood dried up. This woman said, wait a minute, if he can do it for this woman and this man and that lady and that man, surely he can do it for me. So she comes to Jesus, bow down, not worried about anybody else, not a care in the world, not worried about the rumors and what they say and what they think and how they feel. She says, I'm going to Jesus because he is the one who can, who can heal my daughter. Her wall was tumbling down and she said, you know what? I'm going to the one who can pick me back up again, who can make me whole again, who can take care of my daughter. So she comes to Jesus. She kept her focus on Jesus. Kept her focus on Jesus. She let nothing distract her. Nothing sway her. Nothing weighed her down. Her focus was on Jesus. And I challenge you. I challenge you, ladies. Whatever it is that we're going through, even during this time of pandemic, when we feel like things are just not right, we're missing our family. Yeah, I miss going to my parents every day, too. But you know what? God has us here for a reason. God has us here for a season. And we've got to focus, focus on Christ. None of this is a surprise to him. This didn't just happen. Okay, for us, yeah, maybe just like, oh, wait a minute, what happened? God already knew. And he could have stopped it had he chose to. But he decided, no, for whatever reason, you're going through. But how are you going through? 
How are we going through the pandemic? Are we complaining and crying and upset about everything because it's not going my way versus us praying to God, keeping God focused, keeping God as the center, rejoicing to God? Maybe this is the time for us to self-reflect and look at and hear from God. Do like this woman, go fall prostrate before the Father and take your cares to him. And it ends with her with the square of God telling us, and she came home and found the demon had gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. So again, you all note that this woman, this daughter was healed because of her, because of the woman's belief. Okay? Know that it was because of her belief. Just like the woman who touched the hem of his garment, her, she was healed not because of her touch, but because of her faith. So it is as this mother. She her daughter was healed because of her belief. So when you're praying, believe it already done. When you're praying, are you believing it already done? You should be. Believe it already done. Whatever it is you're going through, believe it already done done okay ladies that's it that's all we have for today my hope and prayer is that you've been encouraged i've encouraged myself and i pray to god that you have been encouraged i thank you for your attention i thank you for your prayers i thank you for your support and um let's keep our focus on christ that's it amen. see you later amen <laughs>